was no easy task to awaken them. There is no doubt that Subhash Bose had the genius of which there are very few parallels. He is getting into the ICS and then leaving it. He is getting into becoming a president of the Indian National Congress at the age of 39, 40, and then leaving it at the age of 41. For when, when he was contesting for the second term. So there are many, many outstanding things in such a short life we left. Um, if, we, if we presume that, well, he did die in 1925, then actually he was only 48 when he died. So he was a young man. And he was a legacy and it became a history in his own lifetime, not only in this country, but throughout the world. The amount of connectivity that he was able to get, the long-established regimes and the leaders of that time, whether it was Hitler or whether it was going to uh, Japan or it was in Singapore, there was a great this thing. So I don't think that I'm going to talk, and then his scholarly act abilities, his intellectual and cerebral qualities are really rem remarkable. There are no other leader who probably in real that terms can really match him. But there are two qualities about Subhash Bose which I think distinguishes him most. While others also had many of the qualities that Subhash Bose had. But Subhash Bose had one thing, out of the two things, more important than them. Firstly, he had the audacity. He was a very audacious person. He had the audacity, he was seen right when he was in the presidency college, and he could take the cuddles with his British uh, principal. He had the audacity to go to London, appear for the ICS, and then said, give the, you know, he was ranked very high, and then hand over this thing, he said, when he was asked that, well, what will be your biggest consideration and importance in life? He says, my nationalism. And then he wrote his resignation letter and came back. He had the audacity to challenge Gandhi, but Gandhi was at his prime. Gandhi had a political career, and he was this thing, who was who's a leader for whom probably there was no this thing that when Gandhi wanted to support Patabi Sita Ramaya to be the Congress uh, president and Subhash Bose had an overwhelming support and a majority of the people. But then he resigned. Because he had the reverence for Gandhi. He said, I respect you. I don't stand the way. He had the audacity that when he came out, he started the struggle afresh. He was expelled. He was no more in the Congress. He had resigned from the Congress. And then he was jailed. And then he was still in detention. And while in detention in those days, he decided that, well, let me escape from India. So getting into an attire of an Afghan, quite difficult for a Bengali to do that. He left for Kabul. The resources, the money, the every logistics that you require for such ventures is not that easy. Not easy for a freedom fighter who has got nothing to depend on except his own ability, his own courage, his own conviction. And then from here he goes to Russia, then he found that well, Russians have also joined the British in this war. So he thought not much can be expected from them. So he goes to Germany, meets Hitler, but wasn't very comfortable with this policy of uh, what some of the, the things that he was doing against uh, the same person. And again, that there was a distance and others. But he did form an Indian Legion there, about of the 4,000 Indian soldiers who had been imprisoned by, imprisoned by, uh, by, the, by Hitler. He got them released and formed a legion that they will be joining the India's national struggle. He comes to Japan, from there then he comes to the Singapore, forms the Indian National Army. See the audacity of a man. He must see the 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 I can make it. The real force of my conviction will be able to catapult me to the positions where nobody can even think of. 
You can't even dread even thinking of these thoughts. Probably would be this thing. He walked those things. Whatever ideas he had, he could live up to them. So that is one great capacity. I am not telling it's good or bad, but I am telling in the Indian history there are very few parallels, or in the global history, where the people have displayed that amount of a, of an audacity, of sailing against the current, and not an easy current. It was the current of the great mighty British Empire. And who was with him? No money, no resources. He had to build everything from his own history. Even the party that he had and it served well for so many years. Had made him to resign. He reached to its head and abandoned it. He said that I will. Basically, the differences had started with the establishment in Congress. Netaji said, "I will not compromise for anything less than full independence and freedom." People in 1928 and others started talking about dominant status. People about the states having the elections that you are given some. Delegated powers and others to the people of India. He said it will be total. I want this to free this country not only from the political subjugation, but their political, social, economic, cultural mindset of the people have got to be changed. They should feel like free birds in the sky, which Gandhi ji thought in his wisdom, and maybe it is that probably that was very impractical. It cannot be. He felt and he thought that well, we can do it. And when the Second World War started, he thought that an opportunity has come. And he saw in that opportunity that Britishers were dying, were were fighting the war using the Indian soldiers, 25 lakh of them. Who were fighting for the British? People who died. In the war in which they had no stakes, and when in 1945 Bengal suffered a famine in which over 10 lakh people died, and you know why this famine came? Because the British wanted to carry the food stains for the war effort that it was being shipped to Colombo from there to be taken to Europe. Indians were left to die. It is not only the people at the battlefront who are dying; it is the people here who are dying of depravity and persecution. Netaji felt he had seen the world. He was a very, very bright man. He was much ahead of his age. That this British army cannot fight. If 25 lakh Indian soldiers can be made to realize, is in the today's environment. If you can die for others, for some money, you can die for your own country, and that is how the idea of this thing, which was the, this thing, came up. Well, of course, before the, there were some approximate movements also. I think Mr. Mohan Singh had already created something. Ras Bihari Bose in Singapore had collected the people. So when he came, he did get a certain platform. This is the first time. But by and large, he was a loner. By and large, he was a lonely man. He had no resources. He had no money. He had no country that was supporting him to that extent, except Japan, and that also is a very complex story. That what was the relationship of Subhas Bose or the Indian National Army and the Japanese? It was not all that good. There were very, very difficult times. And then he forms the Indian National Army. He left his house. On 26th of January, and when he came uh, in uh, uh, 1941, and when he formed the Indian National Army, uh, when he formed the Indian National Army, they were the soldiers who had been imprisoned by the Japanese after they were able to take Singapore and also parts of Malaya. Malaya. So he mobilized them and formed the international army. Now, in the history of wars, 
there will be very few conflicts in which you are able to remotivate those people who had fought became imprisoned and were in jail to fight with that ferocity that out of those 40000 26000 never came back never lived more than 50% of the people perished or maybe 58 57% of the people this attrition rate and the army that was still prepared to fight but for the japanese who after hiroshima had to surrender you need a leader of very extraordinary caliber to lead such people leading a winning army is very easy even if there are sacrifices leading a defeated army and people who are scattered all over coming from different parts of the country he gave them one this thing which has also become the indian army is today one this that is our jai hind everybody whatever your race clan religion might be it is all for jai hind he way he never wanted any this clans or castes and regions and this thing he thought india was one so he named his regiments as rani jhansi regiment or mahatma gandhi regiment or nehru brigade and things like that he gave them the slogan of ittihad that is the unity amdad that is the faith and qurbani that is the sacrifice so every indian national army soldier who for you know major mohan singh actually who was the first person to have uh, this thing even before subhash chandra bose came had thought of this idea had had mobilized the people but then the japanese treated him so badly that he had believed that and he had a very uh, difficult this thing. he had three persons he chose to be his generals he had prem kumar sahgal he had shyanawas khan and he had gurbakh singh dhillon all of them were outstanding people so his legacy is totally unparalleled but his second quality was his tenacity it's sometimes very easy to start but there are many there are very few people who can slog it to the end if an idea comes to their mind and after due diligence if they decide to walk in that people may know people may not know they may be sleeping they may be awake they may be observing they may not be but the man is totally street fast he sees his goal day in and day out for him that is something that he has to carry so the seed the idea that came to his mind i'll fight the british i will not beg for freedom it is my right i have to get it and if i beg for it it will be conditional it will have something india would not have been partitioned if subhash bose was there jinnah said i can accept only one leader that is subhash bose he gave that spirit of an this in courage and see the poems that were written at that time for the azad hind fort when he says kadam kadam badhaye ja khushi ke geet gaaye ja kaum ki hai zindagi kaum pe lutaye ja that sense of sacrifice the life of troll is you are no you are not mortal but is for a purpose and if you have got that purpose as high and as lofty to die for your motherland what can be the bigger idea and all were together in that whether it was hindus or muslims or sikhs or any community or any this thing it was totally indistinguishable he he uh, you know his leadership was of a different style there was a doctrine which even churchill used to say that well india is like equator everybody knows in the map where it is but nobody knows on the ground where it is 
So if you walk over the equator, you don't know that you're walking over the equator. He says there's nothing as India. India is a is a is a very uh, 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 ill-defined. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept. There are states, and there are communities, and there are religions, and there are ethnicities, and others, and that which is what we call it as an Indian. He said, no, India was a reality. India is a reality and India will be a reality. It is with this mindset that he traveled his 48 years old journey, lived with that, and what a wonderful journey it was. But a question often comes to the mind. In life, whether your efforts matter or results matter, nobody can doubt about the great efforts. Even Gandhi ji was a great admirer of him. But sometimes people judge you only by the results that you produce. You give your best efforts, but you are not that lucky. Luck was not on you. But was this, so, was this entire effort of Subhash Bose a failure? Was all these his romantic ideas about patriotism, about his great hope and faith and dreams of a great India, were they all something which was only a, a poet's fantasy, which led, led to nothing? I'll tell you one thing. In 1956, you must be knowing, if that was, I'll remind you, Clement Attlee was the Prime Minister of UK when the India's Independence Act was signed. He is the one who had pleaded that let us give freedom to India. In 1956, his term was over in 1951, and after that he came on a visit to meet his friends. He came to India, stayed at Rajbhavan in Calcutta. And, uh, I forget his name, Justice, uh, there was a governor there. Um, they had written his name so far, but anyway, I don't recall it now, who was the, uh, the uh, to the governor. So after the dinner talk, the governor asked him, who knew very well because he had studied in England. He said, Clement, you tell me one thing. Gandhi had given up the Bharat Chodo Andol in 1942 and joined the British in their war effort. So that pressure had gone. You had won the war. So you were the winning and the victorious power. There was no immediate pressure in India for you to vacate. Why did you decide to quit India, the jewel of your, the jewel in the crown? And that too you wanted to leave it overnight. He said, no, we have got a deadline after which we have got to quit, we cannot stay here. You had fought so long and so this thing for 200 years to keep this country enslaved. What happened? And you know, this is written now in a lot of history books, which have this thing and others, it has been now very profusely this thing about that conversation. Even the governor wrote it in his uh, this thing and then came to the newspapers, but people forgot it. That's what I say. History has been very unkind to Nataji. They have not done him justice. So Clement at least said, you know it was Nataji Bose. We knew we cannot face him. He said, even if he had died at the time, there was a popular feeling, and I don't know what to say about that, but that, that 1945 air crash in uh, Taipei, his plan, uh, plane crashed. He says, even if he has died, even after his death, we were afraid of the ideas and the nationalism that he had created, and many Indians could have gone in that path. 
when the Indian Army, which has revolted, or the members of the Indian Army, were joined the Indian National Army, and the mutiny started, or not, if I won't call it mutiny, the freedom of the started in the Indian Navy, and then in the Indian troops, in Jabalpur, in Karachi, the, wherever Neville, uh, this thing was there, that it became, we knew, the straws in the wind where they were going to. The memories of 1857 had not evaporated, had not gone away from the psyche. In their memory track, even today, what they think was a great thing. He said, today, we have got 25 lakh armed, trained Indian soldiers. If they get imbibed with the same spirit of 1857, no Britishers will be left alive here. And this is what Bose had done. So we had to leave. Then I think uh, the governor asked him, but then what about Gandhi? And he said, no, that doesn't matter. Now see what he has recorded in his thing. He said, well, at that time he did not matter. It was both that we gave independence for. How the history has been unkind. And how that person who within his life, I feel very happy that Prime Minister Modi has been somebody who was very keen to resurrect it. I also feel happy that I was associated with it to some extent. When in India Gate, we had the statue of Subhash Chandra Bose, this thing, near, the, uh, so, uh, near the, the, the war memorial of the Indian Army. That he is the one who is leading it. And be, beyond that is something, all the names of the Indian soldiers who have died in post-independence period. The old India gate is the people who died for British. They are the ones who died for India. The new the war mark. The Ross Island in Andaman and Nicobar, in the house where Netaji had this thing, has been renamed as Subhas Bose Deep. The 21 islands have been named in Andaman and Nicobar on the names of those people who Matard themselves from the Indian different sources. So the whole the museum has been created in the Red Fort for the thing because it's called to Dili Chalo because that I want to flag the tricolor. I want to fly the tricolor on the uh, on the Red Fort. And so many other things have been done. And this is what you are doing today is a part of it. It's a part of the larger exercise that you are doing to create a new psyche in this country. You only have to change the mindset and the psyche of the people of this country. They can do wonders. Give them an opportunity. Only thing is that we don't know our strengths. We don't know our capabilities. The political philosophy, the vision, social thinking of Netaji was far beyond his time. He believed in a very strong India. Say, had he succeeded, what would he have done? He said, my first priority will be to give India a very, very strong war machine. Make India impregnable. I will build its defenses. Unfortunately, up to 62, what we did was that there was an idea, should we reduce or disband the army? When General Kariyapa had to go and treat with Gandhiji, he said, now we have got independence, our dushman gone. The value of a soldier got degraded. Both understood it. He knew that if a nation really has got to be this thing, if India had everything, for its long, if it's this thing, a, a better quality of people, more educated, more advanced, better science, better organization. Only thing is that it did not have a very strong defense. It did not build its forces. And that's why the intruders, whether the Hans or the Shaks or the Kushans or the Mughals or the Mongols, everybody came here one by one. 
to transcend our over area and we never learned the lesson then never undermine your security your survival depends on that it may not be visible in the short term but when the catch comes this thing you crumble like a pack of cards if you don't have the people if you don't have the structures if you don't have the organization if you don't have the equipment so subhas bosh wanted to build a very strong army not only that he said i would like to have a very strong war industry now from 1950 to 1962 if we had started building up this thing probably the debacle of 62 might have happened we were we were uh, short of equipment we were short of soldiers we were short of accessibility to the areas that we had to defend and we didn't have probably in the proper plan anyway i don't want to go into that because there are the issues which are not supposed to be spoken me about in uh, this thing but the fact is this we lost the war for which because we were not prepared for it and if a nation is not prepared for a war if you are not prepared to fight and defend yourself don't blame the enemy blame yourself only a weak man is the victim strong nobody this the biggest deterrence is my strength if i am powerful if i am strong there is sufficient deterrence for my enemies to see that i become invulnerable there is some i won't say controversy but there is some thought that whether uh, subhash bose was a leftist whether he he, he believed a very very strong economic this thing of india he said that i would like my first priority will be that if after the political freedom we want the economic freedom we want to become economically strong but he supported this process of planning he supported the process of if i may say the state sector the other at that time now the context is not known the context of that period is was that everything which was associated with the capitalism at that point of time was intermixed with colonialism east india company did not come here as a thing it came here as a colonial company and it was responsible for that every private sector that was doing if you wanted it in the, the, the labor for the tea plantations and what and um, uh, they say you enslave them and send the the direct neighbor to these different places so it was an exploitative regime it is much later that as india freed and the role of private capital and the role and their contribution as the patriots of the thing who probably in the most important way are contributing to this thing so he was not something who was against the private sector he also was something people feel that well, probably he was an atheist he was a highly religious man he was deeply this thing by vivekananda and arvind he always carried in his uh, 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 this uniform and other a uh, book of gita with him every time he, his, uh, the influence of his parents the influence of swami vivekananda and arvind and other this thing and he had profusely learned He had read Vedas. He had read Upanishads. He had read this thing like that. He was a very, very erudite scholar. He was very secular in his outlook. State craft and organization and others. He wanted that no one should be discriminated on the basis of their religion. But deep inside, he was a past and devoted Hindu. He did not make too much of a public display of it. But if you go through his personal this thing and others, well, probably many people will tell you. I don't think that was. I'm supposed to do it anyway. So he was a person who had this day. Had he been today, or had his legacy this day, what would he be like? India to do. India be like. Gentlemen, he had a great faith in the people of India. He had a great faith in their potential. And today, his priority would have been that. if now becoming having become the most populous nation of the world if we can empower and make this 1.4 billion people like what used to say the shattering ram or the 
or the pathor on the sprout or something like that, etc. People with energy, people with fire, people in this, in whatever way of life walk there, whether you're a soldier on the border or whether you are in the business or in the industry or you are a co corporate sector man or you are a professional, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, do it better than what you did it yesterday. Have a fire, think of your country in whatever you are. And I think you are in very unique position. If we can contribute in developing the skills of the people who are working, and are you in your industries, if we can make our labor force today internationally competitive, you know, today we, are, we have got a work, workforce of 495 million. China has got it roughly about 850 million. And 2050, we will have the workforce of 1.1 billion. China's workforce will be only 500 million. We will contribute 40 percent of the global workforce. Prepare and equip them. That is the workforce which are probably that the toddlers, two years old and three years old boy today, will be there at that point of time. Can it be a first-rate engineer, a plumber, or a uh, carpenter, or this? Whatever he does, can he be globally this thing? You see where India. You do not know the contribution of those people who are semi-skilled or unskilled and who had gone from here and, and are working in the different parts of the world. Do you know how much they contribute? We have got a contribution of 100 uh, uh, billion dollars by the people who work in the Middle East who are working in skilled or semi-skilled jobs. It is more than one and a half years budget of the Indian Army. How much they have contributed over the years in building up this country? To say. If you had to build up an economy that can generate that much of a wealth annually, you, could, you, should, you should have the capacity, capacity of annually spe, uh, invest $2.3 trillion. So our biggest strength is our manpower, our human resource, a strongly nationalist human resource, a strongly highly motivated and committed human resource, and developing that human this thing in every work of life. If you are a successful businessman, be a successful, proud Indian businessman. If you are an entrepreneur, see that how you are entrepreneurship. Go around the world. You are globally competitive. Our people, our companies were going and traversing in different parts of the world. They were finding there's a great receptivity for them today. People like your enterprise. People want your technical skills. See whether you can get more and more people, encourage more and more people to get into, to get globalized. We have got the whole world to walk in and walk with. There is no antagonism against India. And today, I think thanks to the last few years of this thing and the Prime Minister Modi's leadership and others, we are getting very, this way, and we are getting in this country. The next thing that we have got to conquer are the barriers of technology. So we should bring in the technology, the critical and emerging technologies, the diverse technologies, even the smaller, uh, this thing, everywhere. If you have got to be globally competitive, you have got to be innovative, you have got to be cost effective, and you must have the high productivity. And if we, are, if we have to do it, we have to invest on our people. And you are the people who are interacting and actually working with them. So if you want to make the legacy, the dream of Netaji come true, let us once again repose. He reposes faith on the people of India who were, who were in a very miserable conditions but were still prepared to fight and he could mobilize them to fight against them and bring the Indian, Indian troops from there to Myanmar, from there, and he conquered. Actually, he had his rule. He had his provisional government for three months. Uh, uh, today is Manipur. He had his, this thing that is... Uh, he, he, uh, there was a government of the international, of the, uh, what was it was known as the, the provisional government of the India. And that was the first provisional government of India. That was all. So if he could enliven, if he could turn these damn scripts into the great explosive these things, is it that something that we can do, our industry can do, our business can do, unite together, imbibe a spirit of nationalism, 
and patriotism and everywhere that they go. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.